on the surface, they're teaching um, to try to look at people without that. But inside the culture, still, because of those those biases that are already there and because of the broader messages of of American society, like those we come to the table with those things already and they don't get addressed. So when they go unaddressed, when we don't learn how to actually uh, communicate to people in a in a in a in an open way, then we move to control. And and so there is a toxic cycle that happens um, that causes more black people to get targeted than not. Welcome to part two of Black and Blue, Policing and Black Lives in America with former police officer Don Carter. This is Loki Mulholland, and it's time to get uncomfortable. There are, there are two things that are roaming around my head. One is, uh, uh, one is that they, they seem to be able to, they being the police, seem to be able to arrest uh, white people for doing the same or essentially the same crime or worse and not killing them where the black guy gets killed, uh, the black male. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's, why why is that? So that's one part of what's in my head. The other part is, what does it take for an entire community uh, to turn against a a policeman? you called him to come in and do something. So he might have made a mistake. He may not have. But the entire community, that cop feels like when he hits that community, they can't stand him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I believe that a message that we've gotten in American culture is that black men are public enemy number one. They're most the most dangerous, uh, savage uh, members of our society. And we see it all throughout the culture, the stuff that gets mm. promoted in movies and music. Like, so we get these messages over and over and over and over and over again. It doesn't mean that they're actually true, but we get the message that they're true. So that's inside of people when they're engaging. And what's the opposite that, and this is just a short way of saying it, but the white man is good. The white man is a savior. He's the master. Like all of those cultural things where white men are hailed as being the the engineers of of goodness in society, yes, benevolent, yeah, yeah. Even even the white picture of Jesus Christ, like so many people in other cultures than white, have a picture of white Jesus in their in in their place of of worship or whatever. Like so, it's like white man is good, black man is a savage, dangerous thing. And so, mm. when I'm approaching a white man, even if he has a gun or even if he has this, he's drunk, he's unruly. It's like Okay, Mister So and So, you know, let's 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 like time, need to, yeah, time to blow it off a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's like calm down. Like we're we're just trying to help you, right? But the escalation between a person uh, who's black and police um, or anybody, like you can see this in the <laughs> in the the barbecue Becky type things and all of those people who you're just in the space with a black man and now you're afraid. Because mm-hmm. of in your subconscious, you believe that a black man is dangerous. And I noticed this in my own life just recently because I had a, a client of mine who shared some stuff with respect to how he manages himself for other people, white people, being a black man. And I was like, damn, how many times have I smiled to make somebody feel safe? Mm-hmm. Like like when I when I'm out in public, I'm I'm a fairly big black man, you know, over six feet tall, over two hundred pounds. Um, and so I just know, I mean, it's generally cause I'm just a, a decent person and just want to greet people. But I noticed that when he said that, I was like, oh damn, I do that all the time where I'm subconsciously trying to make this little white woman feel safe that I'm there. Um, yeah. because in her mind, I'm, I must be dangerous. And so I want to make sure she knows I'm not dangerous. Yeah. So in the film with the uncomfortable truth, LeVon Brown says, you know, this is kind of the catalyst for me making the film was everyone knows where the drugs are, but you'll never see the SWAT team raid a university, mm, mm, but you'll mm. always find them in the hood. Now, when I take that quote and I combine that with what Angela Davis said, which was, we knew that the role of the police was to protect white supremacy. Mm. So why do we find the police in the hood? and not at the university. Man. And is there a 
are, are, are there quotas around this? I mean, I, I know that in the new Jim Crow, uh, Michelle Alexander talks about the system that was in place that, hey, the more drug arrests you make, the more money you're going to get, the more cool stuff you can buy. So I don't know the ins and outs of the 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 command staff and how they manage things or how the money comes into a police department. But I do know what they heralded and I do know what they uh, gave the most attention to and the most attaboys and pats on the back. And it was when you could find drugs and guns. And so whenever I see car stops by police officers and they have a black person, a black man in particular, they're already assuming, and this is what was taught, like that you assume there are drugs and guns. So that when you're in your conversation with somebody, you're having an open conversation, but it's like you are moving toward what you know could be there. So like instead of asking um, a question about what somebody has, you just say, where are the guns or where are the drugs? Because now they have to give you a, a, a it's an open ended question versus do you have drugs on you? They could be like, no. And so there's even those kind of things that were into in, put into police training that uh, it's really just about human communication, but it's the assumption that when I stop somebody that looks like this in this kind of neighborhood, I've heard it a bunch of times that this is a high drug area, this is a this is a high crime area, and that's the justification for the stop of a particular person. Um, and so it's it's to me it's illogical, but it's definitely embedded in the culture of policing. Right. Well, I mean, whites and blacks statistically do drugs at just about the same rate. Yeah. Obviously the arrest rates are different. Yeah. So college kids, I mean, if we want to have an assumptive uh, analogy about it, like college kids are put there, especially certain universities, they have parents who are influential. um, And so those people, if they got arrested or if they got raided or there would be a whole nother, another deal. Um, But in a black community, it's like we we know that black people didn't go and ship guns to themselves from somewhere or that they brought loads and loads of of drugs into the neighborhoods by themselves like we know that so but we never go to the root like we're always just dealing with the 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 latter parts of the process and acting like we're actually doing something and so i don't know why police's police raids don't happen at universities as much as in neighborhoods of color. But I can assume that it's just because the people that are in power or who have influence um, keep them from doing so. My work has taken me to a lot of places and I've been fortunate to meet some incredible people. But when I came to Selma and met Joanne Blackman Bland, I knew I was in the presence of greatness. Joanne was 11 years old when she was attacked on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday in 1965. She wasn't old enough to vote, but understood its importance enough to be there. After Selma is an in-depth look at how our right to vote has eroded since the signing of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the fight for the right to vote continues. Get informed. You can find After Selma on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMulholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. All right. Well, this comes back to Angela Davis then, is that, you know, we know that this is about this is about protecting white supremacy. So that taxpayers don't want to see the police. They want to know that there's a police force, but they don't want to see the police patrolling their neighborhoods. Absolutely not. It makes them feel like, wait a second, there must be something wrong here. Yeah. Now, it used to be that you'd have a police that would be out on the beat and be walking Mm -hmm. around and so forth and know the people. But now I never see a police officer in my neighborhood. I've never seen I can't even think of when one drove, one drove by. Hmm. And I actually have one who lives in our neighborhood, and I've never seen him drive by. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the ta- again, the taxpayers don't want to see that. The white taxpayers who, on average, that wealth, you know, we know the wealth gap in America. So the the majority of the money that people have is in their homes, and white people have the majority of that wealth uh, compared to African Americans. And so... Uh, they have that that greater power. That's where the tax money is coming from to help pay for the police force. Yeah, so you don't want to ups- you know you don't want to upset the apple cart. Right. And now all of a sudden, you have this equation where it's, well, hey, we we need more money because you know we got problems over here, and the and the police believe that, and, and white people believe that because television is telling them that, 
even though, you know, the kids in my neighborhood, they don't get drugs from black kids in Salt Lake City. You know, right. they get it from their from their own friends or their own friends, big brother or whatever it is. Right. Um, so, I mean, is 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 there something to be said about Levon and I said this before that uh, Ferguson, for example, the police weren't there to. Uh, the police were there in Ferguson to contain Ferguson from from breaking out into white neighborhoods. Hmm. Quite frankly, yeah, it, it's it's more about containment to protect, uh, you know, white assets. If you want to burn down a building in your neighborhood, knock yourself out. We don't care. Burn your burn the whole place down. It ain't worth anything, anyways. But don't go don't go storming up to uh, you know to the to the white enclaves. Right. Then we got a problem. Yeah, and I think we saw some of that in some of the protests too, where it seemed like officers might have been standing in between where the protesters were and those more affluent neighborhoods. Um, yeah, at least I know I saw that in Kansas City. The place that they protested was on the the plaza, um, and that's right next to one of the more affluent white neighborhoods that's inside uh, in Midtown. And so it's like they were blocking protesters from even going that far or blocking them from being inside the country club plaza. And and so, yeah, there's a lot of that that happens. I, I remember that that they used to also, there started to be a lot of young black kids that would come come down to that area, which is a shopping district. Uh, the stores closed a little bit early. So if there was any young black kids down there after a certain hour, they that's, that's when they instituted a curfew. They had never done that before young black kids started showing up. Mm-hmm. And, and they would have blamed it on the fact that when all those black kids started showing up, that they would be fighting and doing all kind of stuff, just playing, messing around. Um, but they had heavy, heavy police presence down there to protect the interest of the people on the plaza who owned all that stuff, which are very influential people in the city. So it makes sense. Let me, well, let me ask you a question. Were they wrong? That's a good question. Um, I believe that it was not to people's benefit that it was only that kind of presence brought down there because there was a bunch of young black kids. It was, uh, and I don't, I don't think they're wrong to want to protect the property, but the manner in which those things are done, um, they just taste bad. Right. They just, they just, I mean, you wish it was different. And so again, here's this escalation of a cycle that, if we just left the kids to themselves and 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 didn't pay much attention to it, because they I don't know if they were ever doing anything illegal. They start they started to steal some things at times, but well, as um, a, but but yeah, well, white people steal too. So I'm yeah, just... exactly. But it's it's just interesting that, um, yeah, I don't know if it would have escalated as much because once police presence got heavier down there, then the kids started coming in even more. And I remember we had to corral them like out of the area and it was just, it just felt, it just felt like, like, <laughs> yeah, it just, it did feel wrong. It felt wrong. How do you think that, I mean, our, our, we had a previous episode about uh, racial battle fatigue uh, with Dr. Mm. William A. Smith. Uh, psychologically, what's happening to these kids when the police suddenly show up wherever they are? Yeah. Yep. What does it, what does that tell kids? And what have you seen from the reaction of, of those kids, of, of young black men, of their reaction to how they interact with the police? Because at a very early age, their only interaction with the police becomes this you know, antagonism, you're a problem that we need to solve. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm not, I don't know what they feel or think. I know how they act or how they've acted. And I know that it just aggravates a sense of being a spectacle, like, there's only a certain amount of, of, of room that you have to antagonize uh, a police officer before you know you've crossed the line, but they walk up to that line. And so it it exacerbates whatever kind of uh, crazy behavior they were doing in the first place. It's just like any kid when they get attention doing something crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, you know, just like a kid, if you give them attention when they're doing some bad behavior, they might do it longer. But if you ignore it, um, they'll probably quit sooner. And that's just what I saw was aggravated whenever there was a heavy police presence. And it just, I, yeah, there was stuff I didn't, I didn't like any of it, to be honest. 
um, walking around with the MK4, which is like a the the pepper spray that looks like it's in a fire extinguisher, um, just to corral and run. It's like you're running out pests. And as soon as we got them to a certain part, like we have moved them east, they're on foot. And we're pushing them out of this area into toward the east until you get to where the neighborhood is markedly black. And then you leave them there. And that was it. It was like, what? Really? So we're supposed to be running all these black kids off like they're all from this neighborhood. And there's other issues with that that they would bring up that somebody would let their kids who are 12 and 14 years old be down in the plaza with no parental supervision and all this other crazy stuff. But then we're just going to run the kids into a particular area then bounce? Like, really? So so that's the kind of um, control and wrangling and it's like you're dealing with animals or dealing with pests. You're not dealing with people. And, and, and so that's what permeates police culture, in my opinion. That dehumanizing that you spoke about. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, uh, it just goes to prove our point that most of the people that were coming down there had more money, wanted to shop, and the shopkeepers were upset because people might not come to their stores with the kids hanging around. So the idea was to clear the kids out so that people would shop. And that's really what that's what, what that was. Partially, yeah, it's partially that because the kids would be down there going to the movies, which the movies was open later than the rest of the businesses. And then they ah. just hang out and act crazy, um, just being kids. But if it was a bunch of white kids, would we have done that? I don't know. Um, ah. I, I can I can assume not just because of, uh, I mean, there haven't been too many instances where there were a bunch of white kids that we went to go corral into a certain area um, right. or, or ever, actually. Well, who's calling you when you're when that's taking place? Yeah, that's the, that's a good question. Um, I don't know who would have ever made the first call, but when it started making the news that there was a bunch of young black kids on the plaza, then some action was taken. Um, mm-hmm. And so it could have been one person that called that had something happen, uh, or just the spectacle of a bunch of black kids in a place where they wouldn't usually hang out. Uh, but where else? Like they didn't have anywhere else to go. There was no other kind of. Yeah parks or programs or or anything for kids. So they were going to the movies. So they would go to the movies in droves. And it's the closest movie to the inner city. Well, this is our neighborhood. So, I mean, you, you don't belong, clearly. Yeah. In my other life, I'm a filmmaker. And one of my more fascinating films I created is the award winning film titled Black, White and Us. It's about viewing racism through the lens of transracial adoptions in Utah. Utah? Yeah, Utah. It just so happens to be the transracial adoption capital of the world. So what happens when white families who didn't believe racism existed anymore adopts a black child? Find it on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMalholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. You know, there's been a lot of flag waving around the police over the past several years. Obviously, we should respect the, you know, respect the police, um, but blue lives matter. Right, and some would say that the police are putting their lives on the, you know, putting their lives on the line every time they step out, while others would just say, "Well, look, that's that's the job you signed up for." I think the thing is, we're expecting there's a culture, uh, the policing culture, that says everybody that I run into is probably a criminal, and I'm going to run into more poor people than not because. Uh, those are the places where I get my arrest and the the DAs will get their thing and it becomes a political career so that all of this stuff that we do, we haven't minded up to up till now. We when the, when the police were first started, they started militarizing the police. We didn't care. We meaning society at large. And I remember saying that I was upset about this because one of the small towns near here, the guy shows up with an armored vehicle. There's probably 10 people. Well, that's more than 10. But it's probably 10 people that live in the town. And just because the military was giving him this, he had a, a, an armored vehicle. And I could see where this was heading. So the police now feel separated from the people they are supposed to police, or the people they are supposed to help. The neighborhood doesn't like them. So they've created their own little thing. And it's like the 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 sharecroppers, the the, the I'm sorry, the overseer 
that used to be doing slavery. You take care of these people and we'll take care of you. Mm-hmm. And that's what goes on. And so we don't mind what the police do un- until they come into the wrong neighborhood. Then we say we got to do something. Mm-hmm. So people like Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell and all those people, they don't mind what the police do because it won't bother them. So we have to, the, the, the change that needs to be made, and I get this just from listening to you, Don, is that we need to try and, and, and find a way to get back to, uh, to get the police, those that are good, that we're on their side, and those that aren't, well, they aren't. Because I've noticed, I have on Facebook police people, and I've noticed that not a one of them will say, uh, Floyd shouldn't have been killed without saying something else, mm-hmm. uh, without showing pictures of police getting attacked. Mm-hmm. One can't be without the other. Uh, and so you know that these are probably people that feel that's wrong, but uh, it's just as wrong when somebody goes after policemen. Yeah, it's even and, worse. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, you just made this a lot harder for a lot of people, but I think you're one of the people, if I might say this, you're the guy that should be listened to. How do we do effective policing when other countries take two or three years for a policeman, for somebody to become a policeman and they make educational demands? Well, maybe we ought to do that. Yeah. Maybe we we said that we would, maybe we ought to say that this person needs to go to college for so long and they need to be, it'll be three years before they become a policeman. And by the way, we're going to put this policeman that came from this neighborhood back in it mm-hmm. because he understands it. Yeah. That would make uh, sense. Uh, yeah. Well, that means so, we won't do it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so, I mean, there, there's this perception as well at times where it's look at the people they're hiring, that some people it's, it's their last chance to do so, they, to have a career. Uh, that they lower the bar to be a police officer or some of these people are ex-military that come in Mm -hmm. who probably have a lot of PTSD going on. And now you're going to put them in this, you know, situation where, and the response is one training that's been now applied to another field. And yeah, I'll I'll, just briefly on that note, I've thought about this, especially as I've been having these conversations that most of the guys and girls that I knew who were police officers after having a military career were much more refined. Like they were the ones who were a little bit more even keel, cooler headed, um, that. So more disciplined. I guess it's something, it's something where they have a different level of, of self-control. Um, they know how to take orders and they do that. And so they still have the same perspective, but they don't have the same, like, again, what I see when I see this, this result of, when I see black people getting killed by police uh, in the way that they've been, it's like most of those people aren't cold, heartless, uh, racist, in my opinion. I don't know any of them, but that's just the point that I take. That's the perspective mm-hmm. I take. They are people who have been conditioned to dehumanize this particular looking type of person. So they're disconnected from their own recognition of, of, of what's good in that moment. And they're just working off of training. Right. And so they don't have to be uh, explicitly racist. They are scared and they are reacting to something because part of the police condition is your number one job is to go home at the end of the night. Like that's why people are talking about blue lives matter, like all of that stuff. But it creates this sort of us versus them mentality. Absolutely. Which is the, which is the toxicity in the, in the system. So police officers, it was, I was surprised to learn how much they feel slighted by society and by uh, the people who make decisions for them. Like they feel like they're the rank and file. So when we have movements of police unions and the FOP and all of that, they're supposed to be police advocates. Um, and so I, again, these are just regular human beings who wanted to do good for society, but then get wrapped up in a system that has been created and constructed for the dehumanization and subjugation of people in general, but particularly poor people and more particularly poor black people. Right. So, oh, wow. so it makes it difficult to maintain that without some 
deep strength of resistance. But the people that I've seen who have been able to hold that line even better are people who have been in the military. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, when when we say that you know that the police feel like they're under attack and so forth. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, many people listening to this will go, "Well, gee, yeah, welcome to the neighborhood." Right? Yeah. Right. Um, but that. That's kind of the, that. That is the essence of Black Lives Matter right now. Is that is, is the police brutality mm-hmm. and the killing of of you know the disproportionate killing of black men, yeah, right, and black women for that matter. But what's what's really going on there at that point? Because obviously there's something. I mean, the the, the numbers, the statistics, you know, bear this out that there is something going on that. Um, that the police, yes, yes, do the police kill white people and Hispanics and Asians and you know, yes, of course they do. That's going to happen, but there's something else that seems to be going on, wherein, um, gosh, it, it does, you know, so, someone's running away from the police and they shoot him in the back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is not the first time that's happened. I mean, I think it was South Carolina uh, where we saw that in video recently. Um, that was a couple of years ago. Oh. Uh, the gentleman's running away from the police. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have right. his gun. Doesn't have a, didn't take his taser or anything else. There's no excuses yeah. that you know you can wrap around this and go. Well, yeah, he felt threatened because he had a taser or whatever. But it's, it's, it just happens to end up being that you know shot him like eight or nine times. Now that police officer did end eventually uh, getting arrested for, you know, for killing him. It took a long time, but I, I mean, yeah. When you see stuff like that, what do you say to it? Yeah, I see somebody who is completely disconnected from their own humanity. And they see, again, this is a result. So what we see on these video screens from these phone recordings is the result of something. It's not exposing a cause. It's the equivalent to a sore that has something to do with an internal infection. It is a horrible, like terrible thing to see and deal with, but at least we're seeing it. And it's part of the sickness that we've had in our in the structures of our society that has subjugated human beings to being less than human and it's not that old like we're we're a country that's not even that old and so we we try to make space in between it saying that it was back then but no we get to see that it's still right now and it's inside of all of us it's embedded in the culture and the messages and the indoctrination that we've all endured to some degree and so for police officers, it's even more so because they are the, the strong arm of the executive branch of this government that has this system running it. And it's like, what do we expect? This is no surprise to black people. But what's happening now that's really interesting is that there are non-blacks who are seeing it and like, oh, something's got to change. And so I think it's a, a very good opportunity. It's 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 an unprecedented opportunity for us to really address the core issues that are at play here. Yes, we can talk about police reform and it's necessary. I left law enforcement thinking that the very nature of how we do policing in this society has to change. We recognize that our culture is is founded in violence. And, and so then we act surprised when violence is something that we see on a regular basis. But it's in all of our stuff. It's in our media. It's in our, our entertainment. And so societal reform is what we need. Exactly. And that and I know that's a bigger thing. But as people's hearts continue to open to the realities of who we are, therein lies the opportunity. So having conversations like this to where we are willing to hear each other and we're willing to see from each other's perspective and feel each other's pain, recognize our collective traumas. And, and how we've been inundated with these messages that were all different to some degree, because I have to have uh, I have to mark on a box since I was a kid of what I am and, and that that's how I'm categorized in my society and and where I fit in this caste system. Like the more that we can see that that's happening and where it's happened the most um, uh, drastically is with the subjugation of black people in this land. And and so as we recognize it, that gives us the opportunity to actually respond to it and to respond to each other in it. Um, everybody has their knee jerk and visceral reactions to stuff, but it's, I wish it was more uh, concrete than it is. It's not as concrete because we're going to have to really deconstruct the system that we've lived in, that everything that we know is founded in and figure out how to build a new society. And it's going to take probably the next couple of decades to really get a good, good start on it um, practically 
where we're doing policies, but people's reactions that, you know, talking about defunding the police, huge um, sentiment. Um, And it does address part of the issue where if our police departments have been militarized, over militarized and overfunded, and that there are other causal issues to some of the things that cause there to be need for police activity, then we're moving in the right direction. But it's just the start. It's not it's not the whole thing. And hopefully people's pains that they've experienced when they get vented a little bit um, will be able to have some conversations through. And, 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 and that's what I think will lead to us having a better society. Yeah. So there's definitely a there's definitely a, 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 a culture within the police force in and of itself. But that's uh, reflective, greater. It's a greater reflection of, of what's going on in society in general, just concentrated, if you will. And so we need to transform our society which begins with each of us. Each of us needs to wake up and, and, and start listening and start and start reflecting on how we are contributing to that. Yeah. I'll say that if we had the leaders in our society or the people who are uh, patrolling our society, for lack of a better word, if they were in a different way of being, then it would speed up the process. Because if you have the people who get called when you're at your worst, better equipped to deal with, um, the problem without having to just use force, um, it, it gives a different, it gives a different opportunity, I think. And so police officers used to be called peace officers. Like even what post stands for is peace officer standards and training, which is the, 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 the standard by which police get trained in our society. So what is a peace officer? And maybe going back to what that means to be a peace officer is, is a model for, Plus. for what we could have in the future. That's the Andy Griffith sort of sort of look, mm. right? I mean, coming back to this, you know, the 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 uh, Andy Griffith show. I mean, there was, you know, Andy and Taylor, Sheriff Andy Taylor and his deputy, and they would just, you know, kind of talk to people and help people. Now it's very idealic, you know, very white, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> scenario. But like you said, I mean, it's it's police officers. Pe- pe- we don't have the social um, social care structure that, that, that needs to be there. So now the police are asked to come in and deal with domestic disputes right. that probably should never have escalated to that point. But now the police officer now are just a blunt instrument mm. to, yep. to deal, to deal with these issues wherein really, uh, you know, it's, 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 are, are they the last resort for everything now? Mm. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. If yeah. you look, if there are cultures in the world, there are countries that first of all, all the police are unarmed, and secondly, uh, it takes longer to become a policeman. There are a lot of them that don't even carry guns, but not here, but in other places. So we have to get used to the fact that the only way to solve a problem is with a gun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have we have uh, glorified that position so much that half of this country now has got a gun. They don't know what they're going to do with it, but they got it. An Ordinary Hero was my first award-winning documentary. It's about the life of my mother, Joan Trumpower Mulholland, and her participation in the civil rights movement. For most of us, our mothers are heroes because they're mothers, and mom is just mom. But when your mother is a civil rights icon, and yet you never really knew it, things change. Go check out An Ordinary Hero and find out how choosing to do what was right instead of what was easy help change the world. You can find it on Amazon Prime or visit LokiMulholland.com to purchase a copy for your collection. Yeah, that's a part of American culture. It's a part of it's a part of the root of violence that we have been founded in. And so when we're surprised that it shows up, it's like it's it's funny that it's a, a surprise. This is in every part of our culture. This exactly. idea of being violent to I mean it's how this country was acquired. I'll use that term loosely. Um, And so this is just the stuff that we have been birthed in and we act like we're supposed to be so advanced and and far along, but we're just a few hundred years old as a society. Well, we've we've proven we're not. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, mean, well, well, I mean, you take a look at it. It's like, like you said, we're such a a young country. I mean, the British monarchy is is 1500 years old Yeah, and they still cling to those vestiges, mm, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so why why would we think we wouldn't be clinging to these vestiges of, of you know, the attitudes of slavery and Jim mm, Crow mm-hmm. in today's society? 
because we're all downstream of the past, mm. right? Mm-hmm. We haven't escaped this yet. Nope. We, we've, we've gotten better. I mean, th- things aren't what they used to be, but there's still issues that we still have to deal with today. Yeah, and there's there's the hope, though, because there are some some advancements. And I say this particularly about Black people that, I'm, that impresses me that us being the descendants of some of the most resilient people on the planet, maybe. And I know there have been several... Uh, cultures who have had slaves and all that, but the, the kind of advancement that is, has been made uh, in spite of all of these things is just tremendous to me when I look at it. And so when we look at who we are, I think looking at the past, understanding where we come from and understanding even more importantly, what we want to create, like how, how do we move forward from there? And for as far as policing goes, we have to look at what kind of society we want to have so that we know that the people who are stewarding this society on an everyday basis know how to be. And yeah, police officers get called for everything. I remember a call that I got to get a bat out of this woman's house. And, and so I'm showing up there with a gun and, and with all the other things that are in, in, my, in my psyche as a police officer. It was nighttime. I'm in this, this neighborhood that was a nicer neighborhood but I still have to be on alert. I have to think about if it's a setup call. Like I have all these things that I'm going into a pretty strange situation, but with all of this angst and a deadly weapon on me and ready at any moment to respond to that. And so I'm sure there are stories of benign situations that escalated quickly. And and so rethinking how the people who respond to to whatever our needs are in our society, how they're equipped and what what they embody, like those are the things that I think are, are important to think about as well. Um, just changing the structure itself is part of that, but we got to get to the heart of the issue, which is, to me, it's recognizing um, our interdependence and connectedness in our society. Uh, we've we've drawn lines too starkly over the the decades that make us believe that we're actually different than the people who are around us, and it's something that. It, it, we see it doesn't work. So how do we how do we address those things so that when we have conversations, I'm listening to you not as the other, but as somebody else like me, and 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 then we end up figuring out how to work together towards a solution rather than just uh, lobbying for mine. And 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 so those are things that seem like they're utopian in nature, but it's just basic human interaction. Um, right. And so I think we can do it. I think there's a possibility. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the training that you talked about that you had in the beginning. This, this, you know, so you're going out there and they're going to tell you the lay of the land. Here's how things really work in the world. Yeah. Cause that's what they were taught and that's what they were taught and they were taught. Right. Cause it's, it's a generational thing. Right. And it's the same thing that goes on in society in general. You know, we, 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 we don't actually have to, we don't just necessarily say it all the time. But everyone just kind of knows, and so that's why, you know, what else is a news person going to report on when, when he knows that the thing that everyone wants to hear is is is, is the most racist thing, anyways, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you know mm-hmm. black people committed a crime and mm-hmm. so forth. Um, it's, it's just this perpetuation. It makes me think about you know today is actually the anniversary of when of uh, George Stinney, who was the fourteen year old who was electrocuted in South Carolina. Wow. Today was the day that he was electrocuted. Um, 1944. Wow. He was he was accused of of, of raping a seven year old and eleven year old white girls, and his his trial took ten minutes. Oh my god. Um, and they needed to they needed phone books or something so his head could reach, you know, because they electrocuted him, reach that little cap they put on your head. Um, it took four minutes to to fry him, and fourteen years old, mm. right. Eventually, that was vacated, you know, years later, of course, you know, just recently. But there was that that policing mentality back then, 1944, that stated that a black man is a, you know, even a 14-year-old, right, uh, is a criminal. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting age because that's the same age as Emmett Till. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, Emmett Till had just turned 14. But here's that criminalization of the black, you know, the criminal black man, yeah. right? Yeah. And and here we have today, 
we're looking at George Floyd, right? But the assumption of guilt mm-hmm. from birth of here's a black man and you know, I, I got to make sure I get him under control. Yeah. And that mentality that comes into that. Even the gentleman you talked about from the very beginning on that day where he was born in, I think you said he was born in 1933 or so? Yeah, he was born in 1933. Yeah. I mean, this is an old guy. Yeah. Not that old, it, not that old people are strong no. or, or can't hurt you, but. I mean, you got old man strength, but well, come on now. Yeah. I mean, and that's where people see this all the time. It's like, you, you mean to tell me four officers couldn't figure out how to, how to handle George Floyd? To get him in the back of the car without killing him. Yeah. The one thing I'm going to say is that if you've never seen one of those, an old black man get mad at you, and I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the cops that are sitting there looking at him. Mm-hmm. They've never, mm-hmm. first of all, they've never seen one, and they're told that all those black people will kill you, and uh, they are told that the idea as a policeman is to come home alive. Mm-hmm. So you, you've been filled with all of this stuff. So your first thing is going to be, you either do what I say or I'll kill you. Mm. Period. It's, it's like zero to a hundred, just boom. Sure. Because that's what they're told. Or they've come to believe. Yeah, they've come to believe it. It's it's part of It's part of the culture, especially if you are the guy who, when you show up, Things are supposed to go your way. You're there to control right. and bring order, and so anything that is resistant to your your aims at bringing order and control, then they can get squashed for any reason. I people would say it jokingly, but they would just be like, "You can't tell me that I'm the police." Like that's right. the that's the phrase. I'm the police. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. What's that mean? <laughs> Want a great way to help a worthy organization and educate children about the civil rights movement? Visit our foundation, the Joan Trumpower Mulholland Foundation, at the jtmfoundation.org. That's the jtmfoundation.org. We are a 501c3 established to help end racism through education. A $5 monthly recurring donation will provide curriculum for 30 students. As my mother used to say, I can't do everything but I can do something, because doing nothing is not an option. If you have wanted to help in this cause, but didn't know how, now you can. The Joan Trumpower Mulholland Foundation at the jtmfoundation.org. Well, 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 well then it becomes this, 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 this perception that, you know, someone gets pulled over, and now there's four or five cop cars. It's like... What's what's going on here, guys? Yeah, I mean, so instantly there's this, you know, this instant criminalization, this assumption. Yep, and everything goes around that. Well, you got to be careful because he's going to pull a gun on you. I mean, it's like no. I'm telling you, that's from what everything I've heard Don say. That's what you come to believe. And if you look at all the literature that's coming out, Blue Lives Matter, everybody's concerned about what's happening to the police as opposed to what's happening to the citizens, white or black. Uh, it's a, there's a whole nother world that the policemen live in that mm. we don't. Right. Because right. The, the, the policeman has to live there because now we have all these frightening people as opposed to a few white people, uh, but they have to deal with that. So why, that's why if, you, if you've ever been around people who do prisons, like prison guards, mm-hmm. that is that, I don't know if you ever hung out with a bunch of them, but I'm telling you, they they are just as in jail as the people they're keeping there. They haven't figured that out yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. their thing is, all these are animals. Yep. Rikers Island is one of the worst places you ever want to be, and and the the uh, the the people who are locked up start to hate the cops. The cops hate the people, and it's a it's it's, it's just well, that's what you have on the police force. Well, you're sitting in the car with the guy, you might trust them. You don't trust anybody else. You don't believe in anybody else. Nope. And that's why they, nobody ever asks, why do people come so, why do those partners become so close? And that's why. They have to look out for each other. Yep. And they think that every situation is life or death. Because Absolutely. that's what you're trained to believe. Because the small percentage of those times that it will be, you want to be on. Because you want to go home at the end of the night. Because that's your number one job. 
Absolutely. Man. All right. Well, Listen, I got... What's up, LaVon? You got to go eat dinner or something? Yeah, I'm going to go eat. Man. <laughs> man, I'm, I'm enjoying Don. We got to do yeah. this again. It is good stuff. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's, it's a very, it's an interesting reflection when we're talking about the police and so forth. But we, uh, you know, again, we're talking about greater society and how how and we feed into all of this, and that the police aren't immune to that. That doesn't excuse their actions, no, but it helps explain it, and that we all play a part in dismantling this social structure and this mindset, and that if we really want to change the police, we we got to start changing ourselves. Mm. When I say that, I am pointing the finger at white America. I, I, I got to ask one more question. I apologize, Levon. Stay, hang on for a moment. But with this militarization, with all this gear, I mean, you see the pictures. They got guns hanging off their sides. I mean, Levon talks about this in you know in uh, Uncomfortable Truth, the film. Mm-hmm. But with all that, I mean, as a police officer, what does that do for you? I mean, does that one? I mean, I, I got to imagine it kind of makes you feel like you know, you know, pretty big man big, or pretty big woman. Strong, yeah. But then on the other side, it's like. I'll tell you what it does. I, I need this because they're all out to get me. Yep. No, exactly. You, makes you feel it. safer. Makes you feel safer, no doubt. Period. So if you have but if you feel like safer, it's because you there's a perception of a threat. Absolutely. Well, so, you were told it was gonna be one. Yeah. You, that, you, that, you were that, told that there's, that there's a threat everywhere. And this is you never you never know. So just think about that. Think about the people who believe that everywhere they go at any moment, things could pop off to where they have to show up and do, quote unquote, their job, which is to protect and serve the public. But then they're told that their only job is to go home at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. And and so there's this 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 juxtaposition between who am I looking out for, really? But I'm really protecting myself. I'm really trying to make sure I stay safe. So when you ask somebody, like you can see it in one of the, uh, in the last video, which I forget the guy's name, which which makes me kind of sad to think about, uh, in, in Atlanta, who was just killed. Right. Um, yeah. Where I think at the beginning of that video, uh, or maybe it was a different video I was watching, but this, the, the quote is, uh, you know, why are you why are you doing this is for officer safety. Like so the excuse for a lot of things that are done in these encounters is for officer safety. I'm going to control you for my own safety. And well, that's why all those rules and stuff have been built around them. Yeah. So that the average policeman now can get away with all kinds of stuff because he has to feel safe. Well, for for my own safety, I mean, the old the old saying was, "I thought he was reaching for his gun." Yeah, they don't have to do it anymore. Just the safety, and 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 when they go to court, or if assuming the the DA takes them to court, uh, I I felt for my life. I felt for my own safety, yeah. and sometimes it's the truth. I would I would guess that most of the time it's the truth because they live in this hypersensitive world of thinking that everything is out to get them potentially. Mm. And so it's easy to articulate if you can articulate that you're, you felt your life was in danger. Cause you, when you step into that uniform and when you step outside, you feel like your life is already in danger. And so again, seeing the world as a completely hostile place, except for your own little Haven. And so um, in Kansas city, and I don't know about other places, but in Kansas city, most of the white officers live north of the river because that is a barrier from the rest of the city supposedly and so they feel they would call it god's country or they think that it was some place that they could feel safe and they'd be surprised if there was any crime up there and so there's this illusion that you have to make in your world where i feel safe somewhere because everywhere i go when i go to work i'm completely unsafe and so the minute they step in the uniform it's unsafe they do that in a lot of places where we, we used to live next door to the policeman, that doesn't happen anymore. Mm. Like in California, it's Orange County. Mm. Uh, it's full of cops and F, and and DAs because they don't want to be among the people that they're policing. Right. Uh, New York, it's uh, I forget the name of the town. They all moved up, up, you know, from the Bronx up there or Staten Island. They're all mm. cops. So all those all those things perpetuate that belief that I'm only safe around other people that are cops. Uh, Correct. And when you treat the people in a way that causes them to vilify you and think that you are the enemy when you're in their neighborhoods, then of course it makes sense, logical sense that you would feel unsafe. So these are these are all of some of the issues that are uh, embedded in the broader 
issues of what we have in our society and even just in police culture. But at the core of it, it's because of the dehumanization of people. Uh, is that we see each other as objects and not as human beings. And so I can treat an object much differently than I can treat somebody who I see as like me. Man. Man, I, I mean, I'm, 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 we're going all the way back to slave times. Mm-hmm. Seeing yeah. people as objects. Yep. Well, Don, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on. And, and, yeah, it's uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Providing some of this insight. Man, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Levon's getting hungry, I can tell. <laughs> He's trying to yeah. get me to run. It's a pleasure to meet you, Levon. I look you forward too, to man. it again. We'll talk again. Okay. Thank you again for listening. Make sure you head to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash Loki Mulholland. Show a little love if you can and get access to even more content. Until next time, don't be afraid to get uncomfortable.